Welcome to Immersive Sports Science. Content not commentary, sports science, not bro science. In this review, we're going to be reviewing the documentary Freddie Flintoff, Living with Bulimia. Hi guys, due to the sensitive nature of this topic, I'm going to be using more sombre tones. Please find a link down below for Mind and the Beat Charity if you need help or you fancy donating to these charities. Freddie Flintoff, Living with Bulimia which follows him as he tries to self-discover his bulimia and come to a certain sense of self-acceptance with it and also to try and deal with it and discover it, how it affects sport. Drew Flintoff, otherwise known as Freddie Flintoff because, well, the name sounds like Fred Flintstone. Yeah! Yabba -dabba -doo! Now, for the, anyone who doesn't know who Freddie Flintoff is, you guys in America in particularly know him as the guy who replaced Matt LeBlanc on Top Gear. Freddie Flintoff was one of the best all-round England cricketers with both bat and ball of all time. Something, something fantastic. Something that everybody can identify with. Oh, hello! Massive! Massive! One of the most magnificent strikes you'll ever see. Straight over the top of the stun. What a fantastic strike. He also did a bit of professional boxing, meh, which he didn't do too well. But now his main role is as a team. Remember, you are not alone. There are people out there who will help you with it. What I am talking about is the context and where it's in, and within the context of those who are obese and need help with obesity and obesity eating disorders. When relevance is key about talking about information, and quite a lot of people, especially intuitive eaters, intermittent fasters, often are very tribal about the type of information they portray, and that their information is the only information and the right information, and that's incorrect, including with how you deal with eating disorders. Everyone's mental health issue which an eating disorder is, is going to be different and therefore you have to take in those individual differences and needs when it comes to treatment or dealing with mental health issues and anything to do with fitness, health and sport. Freddie Flintoff Living with Bulimia is an observational mode documentary utilising different style of formats from talking head to actually following Freddie Flintoff through his journey of self-discovery and acceptance. The documentary started with a glimpse of an interview he had talking about his own bulimia and what he does. It then followed Freddie Flintoff from the beginning of his career, starting off at Lancashire Cricket Club. And as he moved through the from here, he detailed the body issues he had at the time being a tool. As a new recruit to the England side in 2001, he was an under constant scrutiny from fans, the press and his colleagues, Flintoff felt pressure to keep his weight soon spiralled into something he battled with through his entire career and which he hasn't fully dealt with to this very day. The show was keen to draw on the experiences of others and how Freddie Flintoff, with his own mental health issues, could relate to these particular individuals. This is important because mental health is an interpersonal issue. Before we see Freddie himself go through case formulation and bulimia, like all eating disorders, is a mental health issue that is characterised by a series of purging. Over 1.5 million people in the UK suffer from eating disorders like bulimia. Experts estimate that one in four sufferers are male. And this is 16 times more likely to be in sport. Of course, guys, if you need help, I advise you to get help because, because you're nine times more likely to recover from bulimia if you receive professional help. In many aesthetic and athletic sports, it's often seen as being advantageous to be lighter. This is because force times mass equals acceleration, meaning the lighter you are, the same amount of force means you'll be able to run or be able to perform that move faster. Now, obviously, we got to take into account requires you to have the same amount of muscle power. We can see this from a similar case with Dom Sibley, who in who lost 12 kilograms during lockdown in order to help improve his performance and also because he felt self-conscious about his weight. He wasn't performing necessarily as well, especially when they did a tour of Sri Lanka. 
then that's not a normal behavior. Take this hypothetical situation. Two athletes characterized by similar behaviors, yet only one has an eating disorder. This is because the one athlete has anxieties about their food and food intake. The area of growing knowledge around eating disorders comes from mixed martial arts and boxing. After my cricketing career was cut short by injury, in 2012, I decided to take up professional heavyweight boxing. Not least because I knew it would involve losing weight. The process by which fighters shed weight is known as the cut. I didn't like getting it in the end. Um, I didn't particularly like hitting people either. But the punches in the end, it was worth it to lose the weight. I lost three and a half stone on that. And I went from 118 kilograms to 96 in three months. Cutting is an extremely dangerous process, both mentally but also physically. Many fighters have died cutting for their weight in order to make the weight category. I killed myself to get abs. I was on this diet where I had no energy, I had nothing. And at the end, I stood in front of the mirror, thought, you've got abs, haven't you? Well done. What happens next? I'm, I should feel better than this. It was everything I ever wanted. Were, in some ways, I look, at, I look at my eyes and there's nothing behind them. I was about 113 kilo when I started, and then I had my first fight at a 73 and a half. Extreme things people do to sort of get the weight off. Purged, vomited. It was just something that I had to do to achieve a goal. I suppose I knew that I shouldn't be doing it, but I had to make weight. I can do this to make weight. All of a sudden, the fight's over and tell yourself that you've got this. What we are seeing is a rising eating disorders in male athletes that were normally associated with female athletes, especially in sports where having low weight is important, if not beneficial to performance. The concept of exercising your calories off so you can eat more is problematic, but we have to take this with a pinch of nuance. Month long window of opportunities to stuff your face. You start the next fight camp big and then You've then got a yo-yo diet under each, which makes you crave more, and it just becomes a vicious cycle. For me to weigh in at 61, I walk around at 70. After the first pro fight I had, I turned up here a week after 81 kilos. Mm -hmm. That's 20 kilos heavier than the weight that yeah. I weighed in at. Yeah. Now, if you put that into bottles of water, it's 20 litres of water. So that, to me, that's an eating disorder. That's, that's not healthy. Yeah. Historically and socially, men often do not portray their feelings because they were seen as socially desirable. Now, we know from this that Freddie Flintoff didn't talk about his eating disorder, but only told his wife. Us men have been utterly useless when it comes to discussing mental health. We kind of keep it inside ourselves and we don't discuss it often enough. You can find out my views on that matter from my own personal battle with depression from this review I've done of Niall Wilson, Silent Battle. Also, there has been a lot of medical stigma surrounding not only obesity, but also eating disorders and how we deal with them both, which are a completely different context. Treat them is gonna be different. This is from a medical model perspective. The only time I did come close to asking for professional help was while I was still playing cricket. I was a dietitian, and I thought, well, if there's ever a time to speak to someone, it's this woman who's coming in. And I decided halfway through, you know what, today's the day, I'm, I'm going to tell her. And just as I decided in my head, she said she works with female Olympians and gymnasts. A lot of them have got eating disorders. But there'd be none of that in this room, will there? Thanks a lot. So then that just knocked me. Um, and I carried on. And she wouldn't imagine there's anyone with an eating disorder in this room because we're a group of lads, obviously. Um, so I didn't feel that I could speak. I didn't feel I could say anything. And I think as well, being a bloke, you know, I'm six foot four, I'm from Preston. I'm not meant to have a eating disorder um, by rights. Generally in psychology, you got a med medical model perspective, and then you generally have the psychological perspective. And on a medical model perspective, we're looking to, to aim to fix something. You go over to some of these people because there's something wrong with you and you need a prognosis or a diagnosis to help you with what you are looking to fix. And that's the key word, fix, in that title. The psychological perspective states necessarily that it might not be actually be a problem and that we should learn to help you deal with that situation a lot better. Both perspectives have their rightful place and can be used interchangeably within practice. It's key to know 
that our knowledge of mental health issues has changed well considerably since the 90s and the noughties from when Freddie Flintoff started playing. Your mental health issue was seen as a weakness and in certain issues within sport, someone might try and utilize that against you in some way or another. It's naughty and they shouldn't do it, but I've seen it all the time. People will see these people and even in general life as being incompetent, being a hindrance and that needs to be taken out because we need to facilitate these people in order to help not only with their recovery, but also to better that work environment. But it, it, it's still that stigma that it's like a weakness. Yeah. And I think coming where I've come from, and you're always taught, you're like, you don't talk about things like that. And because it's drilled into it, opening up about an, an illness that can be perceived as a weakness in a bloke, you sort of don't want to talk about it. Where you come from shapes you. It does instill you certain beliefs. It's one of them being, this doesn't affect people from my background. You're meant to be tough, you're meant to be strong. If you give something away, then you're weak. That becomes exhausting. Some people don't want to show weakness. You got to the point where, you know, you went from maybe being sick in the bathroom to actually being sick in the bin, maybe going outside out the back of our yeah. the patio and being sick, like, maybe beside a tree or something. You weren't allowed to say anything. Everything was a secret, you see. People fight their own battles behind closed doors sometimes. Because I were embarrassed. It's my business. No one needs to know. In my head, I'd think, oh, they'd, they'd rip me to pieces. Yeah. Nobody would talk to me and things like that. Telling people the strength is being able to have a conversation own up to whatever your weaknesses are. But remember guys, it is not a weakness. You may need help, but you may need to reframe the situation. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist or a medical professional. If I can't help you. But it's about taking ownership and accountability. But likewise, in the 90s and noughties, we thought originally that this was only a female problem. But since the 2010s, our understanding of how mental health issues are in men especially amongst sport, where it's going to be more likely to happen and be more common, is greatly improved. And we have a greater understanding, not only scientifically, practically, and also emotionally as well. Society has a better understanding, but there's still a long way to go. Then when we realise, OK, it's, it's this thing, bulimia, well, what the heck's bulimia? What never happened there, Freddie, was that nobody sat down with you and helped you to actually go through what you were experiencing at that time. He went to the doctor once and uh, unfortunately the support wasn't there and I think it was due to the lack of understanding. So he had insomnia, complete insomnia. He was severely depressed. It was very stressful for us knowing that he was eating and vomiting and watching him fade away. His body had gone too far with it and heart couldn't cope any longer. In the middle of the night, I think he was just just breathing his last breath, basically, and it rushed in. And we actually tried to give him CPR. Uh, it was already too late, so um, yeah, he just he just didn't wake up. One minute, my son was standing in front of me, and the next minute, he's a memory. I'm constantly thinking about the calories, so it's black and white. That's the damage. It's almost like taking yourself hostage. Yeah. There's no enjoyment. No, it's no, just... and I know the I know the consequences will only be negative after that. Yeah. I, I think it's a way of just self harming. What the film didn't allude to was the two sides of Andrew Flintoff. And he was very funny, but at home, he would have been easily, you know, stressed. But yeah, I guess, you know, underneath he had those insecurities. Freddie, or is it Andrew? Because very interestingly, in the interviews you've been giving Fred about this, there are two people, really, aren't there? Mm. There's Fred, the warrior sportsman who seems completely fearless and has no problem devouring Aussies for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And there's Andrew, who seems a much more sensitive character and has talked very powerfully about depression and anxiety and now bulimia. Are, are there two people here, two characters? I, I think that sums it up pretty well, Pierce, to be honest with you. Um, I remember when I was young, when I started playing professional cricket and I was a shy, quite retiring young lad. I don't think that 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 would have cut it in the world of professional sport. So this Freddy character seemed to develop where it was seen to be bulletproof. Nothing's going to bother him. Um, every time you walk out into a field or a situation, you've got it under control. Um, and I, I developed that over a period of time, I suppose, just as a coping mechanism. Um, don't get me wrong, it was a lot of fun as well. What was odd about this film is that they never really explored this. They never really explored the dual personality of Freddie Flintoff. And oh, that, 
Slashinger V series back. Those were things of beauty. But as Freddie Flintoff did better in his career, he associated with himself being lighter in order to helping that. Maybe that was giving him the confidence, giving him the ability to be able to perform and to improve his life off the pitch. Floyd, it's well done. I'm just going to be running as fast as I can here, trying to get these old legs moving. And how fast is that? Mate, you just wait and see. <laughs> Make sure you're backing up, Fred. Have you done your stretches, big fella? Oh, the armies are loose. They're loose. <laughs> How many Red Bulls tonight, Fred, as you wait in the bat? I've only had two. I've got, I've got one left in my bag for bowling. <laughs> I'm charged. One of the misconceptions with bulimia is that it's just throwing up. That's not necessarily the case. Exercise can be used as a tool that aids their bulimia. Exercise can also be the very thing that helps them find control in their life. The anxieties you have around food and the amount of training you're doing, Yeah. the balance is off. But I've, I've got coping mechanisms. I train, you know, probably nine, ten times a week, but I enjoy it. Nine, ten times a week? Yeah. I go to the gym, if I'm at home, I go to the gym most days. How long is each session? But I, I'd never do more than an hour. Well, you can't carry on doing that, can you? Why do you think that's a lot of training? But, well, for me, that was, wouldn't be sustainable. An athlete has to train, otherwise they won't perform. And their training's often more intense, and they do more of it. An ex-athlete is more likely to take on this intensity after they retire. But for the average person, that would be not sustainable. I think coming out of it and after treatment, it's made me realise that that ain't normal. When's the first time you eat, Freddie? I don't know when I'm going to eat or if I should eat. Don't get me wrong, I, I, I would sooner get up in the morning. Yeah, and have some breakfast. But if I do, I won't be happy. I'm always trying to lose weight. When you talk about feeling better when you're leaner, what they see is how they actually feel. Shifted to being your belief that being thinner makes you happier, it makes you more acceptable, it makes you yeah. perform better. They're your beliefs, right? And going against them feels really uncomfortable again. So lucky with so many things that if this is the one thing that is a bit of a battle, I'll take that. And people get from a very dark place to a place where it's functional and it works. Does it mean that you're completely free? Niche, they had the perfect opportunity to talk of Freddie's other mental health issues and battles. For instance, his issues with alcoholism. We just won the ashes there. How good's that? And I was sat with Army. I got a cigar and a beer and he's got the ashes and then we just started. 6.15 <laughs> the game ends. Champagne and beers until 10. Yeah. Hotel bar at 10.30, more beer. 12 a.m. Soho Club Prophecy ran up a £34,000 bill. At 5.45 a.m. Gin and tonics followed by vodka and cranberry. Healthy. 10.30 a.m. Mansion House, the Lord Mayor's reception. Uh, Freddie trips and gets on the bus to Trafalgar Square drinking champagne directly from a bottle now, presumably to save time. 1.30 p.m. 10 Downing Street, where you swing on Leo's swing <laughs> you ask Cherie where the loo is, you're thrown out of the cabinet room for pretending to be the home secretary. I was, I was sat in the cabinet room and I thought, this is just so good. And <laughs> I, had, I had a bottle of Bex in my hand and I had my feet on the table and I was like hosting <laughs> me on meeting. You then may have thrown up in the garden and you are accused, Andrew Flintoff, of urinating on the Downing Street flower bed. Historically, cricket players have suffered badly from mental health illnesses, especially within the England setup. There's another side to good health, good mental health. I wish I could just get an injury so I can just get six months out. That's not a cool place to be. What do you do? As soon as you take your whites off, your value and your brand just if cricket didn't go right for me, I would stay in my room. I did isolate myself. I think part of me is a bit of a, like a, a joker character. When I have my low moment, I think, oh, I'm looking forward to room service. Everything is there. I would eat everything from it. I will just stuff myself with all this sort of unhealthy foods, crisps and the chocolates and the fizzy drinks, and I just sit there and think, oh, this feels great. Actually, I'm all right now. That starts to build up after a while. That's an addiction. I'd always been resistant, really, to sports psychologists or people to talk to about that stuff because I felt as though I would learn more from dealing with those problems by myself. Nobody cared about Finn. 
All I cared about was freaking go to the nets and hit that target. The doctor would ask me, how's the bowling going? Burst into tears. I was trying so hard to get it right and trying not to let myself down, I suppose. Just was awful and lonely. I remember thinking, there's something not quite right. I can't concentrate or I'm, I'm quite easily distracted and, and I'm losing focus on what I'm normally so good at. Breakfast, you know, and just in tears, basically, trying to hide it from my teammates, having my cap over my eyes, eating my cornflakes. That was horrendous. Yeah. Just crying in a dressing room. I was completely gone. I mean, completely gone, and, and why they let me do the press. Jimmy and I were sat on the physio bed. Trotty walked past us, just pouring with tears. Jimmy and I looked at each other like, have I, have I just, did I see that right? You know, I don't know, what's happened there? If you've got a guy that's crying, it just tells you everything you need to know about that environment. And would you feel that now you're, you're controlling the eating disorder rather than it's controlling you? Uh, no. At that time, I'd be bringing up just normal meals. If I felt bloated or my belly, I was obsessed with like, my love handle, even though I were, there were nothing on yeah. me. I skid, like I was shredded. I'd noticed that I was losing control of this, believe me, me making myself sick. Right. The film followed an observational mode documentary which followed Freddie Flintoff, or Andrew Flintoff, as he explored his bul bulimia, both through interviews with the different interviewers, as well as looking at through the experiences of others. There was a heavy use of darker colours, obviously to show that it's quite a serious issue, quite a dark issue. The director was keen to show Andrew Flintoff, not the Freddie Flintoff that we all know, and in a way it was quite disappointing in that respect. We all like, like and love Freddie Flintoff, this humorous, happy-go-lucky character. But him utilising his reflective practice and reflecting upon his feelings, we got more sombre tones and much greater depth of information. The director was also keen on showing the pauses in the voices of Andrew Flintoff and the people he was interviewing. I'm always trying to lose weight. Why? This is an attempt to make it more humanistic, more personal to the viewer. The use of uncomfortably close headshots also helps us with this, gives us an uncomfortably close impression of Freddie Flintoff. This was enhanced by them highlighting his mannerism. In this powerful and unflinching documentary, Freddie Flintoff goes on an actual personal journey to explore the eating disorder he has kept secret for over 20 years. Freddie Flintoff living with bulimia was a highly poignant film that will relate to a minority of people who watch it. The film did a good job in highlighting what bulimia is, especially with it relating to Freddie Flintoff, although they could have done a better job explaining his other mental health issues. Alas, this is not what the film was about. It specifically aimed at a very specific thing that was happening to Freddie Flintoff and its wider context. Filmmakers were highly respectful and tried to show this within their film itself. Were there. It was mainly specifically aimed towards the conversations Freddie Flintoff was having with specific individuals about the eating disorder. The film was also very good at highlighting the storyline arc of Freddie Flintoff, how he got his bulimia and his journey in order to help get it fix, which is probably the wrong term to use, if at most at least trying to understand it. All in all, I give Freddie Flintoff, living with bulimia, a KSA score of 96.56. What a shot. Oh, hello! Massive! Massive! One of the most magnificent strikes you'll ever see. Straight over the top of the stun. What a fantastic strike. Beautiful, straight, free flowing bat. Oh, well, now it's six more. We're witnessing something, something fantastic. Something that everybody can identify with. Just thrilling sport. <laughs>